If you can turn off your camera, I would appreciate it. All right. Well, welcome to uh, a, another Nisi webinar. This one is featuring um, a terrific speaker, a presenter who has uh, worked with a lot of different uh, organizations and clubs and such. Mahesh Thapa, he is uh, from the Pacific Northwest and he is a master photographer and very familiar with filters and with taking landscape and, and uh, nature photography. And he will be going over his um, take on using filters, using Nisi filters in particular, but uh, actually it's gonna pretty much cover all the filters that you can possibly uh, use in uh, landscape photography. So as you know, this is hosted by Nisi. And as we do with every uh, webinar that we do, we always have a little bit of a special going on and we have uh, our usual 15% off and we have a coupon code that you can use. And hopefully that's gonna pop up on the screen in just a second here. There we go. So the coupon code will give you 15% off any Nisi item on the uh, website. The one thing that is excluded is our new lenses. Uh, you may know that we introduced a 15 millimeter Sunstar lens uh, last year, and we just introduced a nine millimeter ultra wide for APS-C cameras, such as the Sony's and the Nikon Z50, uh, and of course the Fujifilm X series of uh, APS-C cameras and the Canon RF. Now those unfortunately can't qualify for 15% off, but please do check them out. But we do have 15% off of all of our filters, our close-up lenses, our macro rails, our accessories, uh, our, our line of uh, products have grown tremendously over the last year. And it's definitely worth taking a look at the uh, website and seeing what we have that's new and exciting. Do we also have an Explorer coupon that we can use? Yes, we do. <laughs> we have uh, our new brand of Explorer, which is the uh, tripods, L brackets, lights, uh, interesting and unique mounts, both for cameras and for iPhones, because iPhones are becoming more uh, ubiquitous in photography realm. And we'll be talking about that as well. So, before I hand it over to Mahesh, I'm going to say, uh, first of all, please turn your cameras off so um, we have an uninterrupted view. And um, if we can also please put any questions that you have into chat, and I will try and answer them during the course of the uh, presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, time allowing, we can actually have direct questions where you come on screen. But I will answer questions as I can. And if there's a question that I have to interrupt Mahesh for, I will pop in and quickly ask him that question. So uh, without further ado, I'm turning this over to Mahesh. Mahesh, welcome to uh, Nisi webinar. Thank you, thank you, Jim. This is a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna just start sharing my screen now. Uh, and hopefully you can see that. If you can confirm that for me, Jim. You are you are good to go. Perfect. Like Thank you. I feel like that's uh, that's a ubiquitous question. You know, that's that's like a required question for every presentation. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? <laughs> I wish there was some kind of other feedback that I could get, but it seems like the one time I don't ask that question is the one time that uh, people can't see me or hear me. So that's thank you again, Jim. Nisi, it. it's, uh, it's been a great journey so far. Uh, I'm a big fan of your products. Um, and, you know, as I've said to you, Jim, before, you know, I, I only use products that I really believe in and that I use all the time myself. And Nisi is definitely one of those items that I, that that's essential in my, in my gear. And today <clears throat> I want to maybe explain some things, reiterate some things, uh, talk about some things you may or may not know, or maybe refine your knowledge about about various types of filters that I have experience with, 
uh, that I have used in the past, uh, often very extensively. Now, there are a few filters that I have not used, so I'm not going to talk about that, but they really aren't used in landscape photography that much anyway. So if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to go to the chat function and ask them. And as Jim says, if he can answer it within his realm of expertise, he will. But if he can't, or if he thinks the question is more direct towards me, I am more than happy to stop and answer them. I want this to be as interactive as possible. So, so you uh, feel like you're getting your questions answered uh, um, and your comments being heard. Uh, a couple of disclosures before I get started. <clears throat> I am a Sony Alpha Collective member, which means basically I'm an ambassador for Sony Alpha. Uh, I use Sony products and basically all the images you see here are taken uh, with the Sony system. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I recently also become, uh, thankfully, a Nisi educator. Uh, and so that uh, that means this talk is being sponsored by Nisi. So much of what I talk about will be based on Nisi filters, but you know, uh, the concepts are what's important, I think. And so you can apply those concepts once you understand them uh, to, to anything you like. <clears throat> now, don't feel like you have to write anything down or, or, or take notes because I've basically um, made the written form of this available on my website. If you go to starvingphotographer.com, the very first article that you see will be Landscape Photography, My Guide to Using Filters. Just click on that. Uh, and you'll get, uh, you know, a, a, a word version or, or something you can reference later on if, should you need to. So go ahead and take a look at that if you if you want to. Okay, we're going to first start out just talking about ND filters in general. Um, with an audience like this, it's hard to gauge what the level of each participant is. You know, do you come in with a lot of knowledge? Do you come in with no knowledge or somewhere you're in between? So it behooves us to sort of go through the basics first and bring everybody at least to a middle ground. So some of the terms I use, some of the initials I use as I go through uh, become a little more second nature to everybody. So ND basically means neutral density filter. In essence, it's just sunglasses for your lens, if you will. In fact, back in the day when I was, <clears throat> when I didn't have ND filters and I was really <laughs> poor, I used to take my sunglasses and put it in front of my uh, in my lens and put a, use that as a cheap man's uh, ND filter. So, uh, so that really is an ND filter. Uh, it's basically a dark piece of glass that prolongs your exposure time, if you will, to get certain effects, or it basically diminishes the amount of light that's hitting your sensor or your film. And the word neutral is very important, <clears throat> excuse me, in this, in this term, because the really good filters are truly neutral. There's no color cast. In other words, if you put that in front of your lens, there's no blue tone or an orange tone or yellow tone. It's nice and gray. So basically, the only thing that changes between a filtered image and a non-filtered image is the exposure time. Uh, or, or other parameters, you know, your white balance should not be affected whatsoever. So uh, most filters have a little bit of imperfection, impurities, which can't be avoided, but the really, really good ones like Nisi will keep that uh, to a very, very minimum. <clears throat> and just remember that the darker the sunglasses, if you will, the, the heavier the ND filter, the more likely it's prone to having these color imperfections. So a 10 stop, we'll talk about the stops being, so a 10 stop ND filter inherently will have slightly more color imperfections than a three stop ND. That's just sort of the nature of the beast. So speaking of strength, let's just go through that really quickly. Basically each whole number in the change of stops that you go, it's you're diminishing 50% of the light coming in. So for example, let's say you set up your tripod uh, it's an overcast day and you, you're shooting at F11, ISO 100, uh, and you look at the parameters and it says to get the proper exposure of your image, meaning that the brightness is, is ideal, the camera says, oh, you know what? It's going to take one second to get that proper exposure. So if you put a one-stop ND filter on top or in front of that lens, it'll diminish 50% of the light from hitting that sensor. Now, if you wanna maintain that same level of brightness uh, that you did without a filter, you're gonna to have to increase your exposure time, given that every other parameter is left the same, the ISO is left the same, the aperture is left the same um, by two seconds. 
if you put a two stop, now you double or you inhibit that even further by 50% or the quarter of the light is hitting your sensor. So you have to increase your time by four seconds, three stops, eight seconds. So I think you understand that concept. You're doubling the amount of time that you need to hit the sensor based on how many stops of light you are inhibiting from hitting that sensor. And this is a, this is a fundamental concept. And if you have any questions about this whatsoever, please put it in the chat and we can, we can always talk about it a little, a little more further on. So there are several instances when you might want to use an ND filter. And as a landscape photographer, the number one reason I use ND filters is to prolong the exposure time, right? If you want to, for example, smooth out some ripples on the water, an ND filter is a great way of doing that. You can make a sort of choppy reflection look really, really good because all those little ripples over an extended period of time will average out and give you this nice clear reflection that's nice and smooth. If, for example, you want to have this sort of moving effect, smearing effect, if you will, of the clouds, this is also a great time to use an ND filter because it prolongs the exposure time and the slow motion of the clouds is going to be really well captured in this sense of movement. Now, just realize that the clouds that are closest to you, the maybe closest to the sensor, at least, the one that's overhead, they're going to appear to move a lot faster than the clouds that are at the distance. So if you look at this image, the clouds in the distance over here, they don't look particularly smeared because the amount of distance that's being covered, that's being perceived by the sensor is much less than the clouds up here at the sides or on the top because they're, they're looking like they're really moving faster. So it's going to give you that effect, okay? And how much ND filter you need depends on the effect you're going for and how much ambient light there already is. So for example, if you look at this, there's actually a lot of ambient light already available. So this was taken uh, in close to midday. So there's a lot of light. So for this, I probably needed something like a 16 stop ND filter to give me an effect that looks like this on the clouds, as opposed to if it was an overcast sky, or if it was much uh, after the sunset had happened, you may need only two or three stops because those three stops will already prolong the time enough because you didn't have to inhibit as much light from the ambient uh, surroundings. So hope that makes sense. So that's one good example of when you should use an ND filter. Another time is if you want a shallow depth of field in very bright conditions. So let's, let's, let's think about this. Let's say you're trying to take a portrait and you want to blur out the background. You're using your 50 millimeter F12 lens or your 35 millimeter uh, F14 lens. And then you set your ISO to 100, the lowest ISO you'll go. You set your shutter speed to the highest shutter speed you can go, one four thousandth of a second, one eight thousandth of a second. And you really want to use that shallow depth of field effect of the F14. Yet, when you look at your back of your camera or you take a picture, everything is too bright. This means that for as bright as that aperture was, and as low as you could go on your ISO setting, and as fast as you could go on your shutter speed, there's still way too much light coming in through the lens and hitting the sensor to give you the proper exposure. This is a great time to put an ND filter on because ND filter, remember it uniformly decreases light from everywhere. So it's not just you know, diminishing light from the highlights or just not just from the shadows or whatever, it's all light that's hitting your sensor. So now with the three-step ND filter or five-step ND filter, you can, use an aperture of f1.4 or what have you and still be able to get that shot without it being overexposed and still get that nice shallow depth of field that you may want. So this is very, very important to outdoor uh, uh, portrait photographers that, and even videographers. Videographers often use, to ND, use ND filters because they want to maintain a certain shutter speed for their cinematic effect. So this is something you may not think about because it doesn't happen very often. Uh, but during our last solar eclipse that sort of went through the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, a lot of people photographed it. And you know, some people didn't do it the right way and they damaged their equipment, they damaged their eyes. So for solar eclipse uh, photography, or just even if you want to take pictures of the sun, you need very, very, very strong ND filters, 16-stop ND filters. Sometimes you have to even double up 
an ND filter, you know, a 10 stop and a 15 stop or 16 stop and a five stop, really strong ND filters. And realize that just because you have an ND filter on in front of your lens, it doesn't mean you're protecting your eyes, okay? So if you're looking through an optical viewfinder, okay, you're still gonna have UV light that's coming in, that's gonna affect your eyes. And particularly if you're using a magnified lens, if you're using a 500 millimeter lens, 400, 600 millimeter lens, yes, it may look kind of dark, but you're also you know, concentrating the amount of UV light that's coming in through the lens, bouncing off the mirror and going into your eyes. So really be very careful when you're uh, doing any kind of solar or solar eclipse photography, even with strong ND filters. So, but this is a great example of where ND filters will look really, really great and will come in handy. Okay, so those are pure ND filters. Now there are several types of ND filters. There are round filters. They're what I call quadrilateral filters. So quadrilateral incorporates both uh, square filters and uh, sort of rectangular filters. So th those terms together means quadrilateral and they're drop-in filters like you see in over here. And we'll briefly mention what drop-in filters are if you're curious. Okay, they also make what's called a variable ND filter. And you may have heard of this. This is very popular with videographers because they wanna be able to change the amount of light that's coming in quickly as they're going from scene to scene, as they're going from indoors to outdoors without having to go and uh, you know screw off one ND filter and put another one in because you can quickly adjust the amount of ND that happens. So Nisi, for example, makes one of my favorite variable ND filters. You know, before this ND filter, I used to basically not recommend variable ND filters to anybody because each time I used it, I often went to the very extreme ends, you know, like if it was a one to 10 stop, I, went, I was at the 10 stop and the one stop. And essentially variable ND filters are just two polarizers stacked on top of each other. As you know, as you move the polarizer and we'll talk about that, as you move the polarizer, it diminishes certain light angles from hitting your sensor. Now, if you have two of them stacked, now you're diminishing almost all the light depending on how you turn it. So for example, here, I'm gonna just briefly stop my screen just so you can uh, see what's uh, what's going on here with this. Uh... Okay, so hopefully you can see me. So this is a variable ND filter. And if you look at the writing here, it goes from one stop to five stops maximum, right? And I think that's the ideal amount. You don't want something that says that goes from one stop to 10 stop, because ideally anything beyond five or six, you're gonna see artifacts because it is two polarizers that they're spinning together to match. And oftentimes you'll get what's called these crotch hatch type uh, artifacts, which are which is ruin your image. But you want something that's conservative like this one to five step. And Nisi has done something very clever when they made this. It's still two circular polarizers on top of each other, but they have stopped you from going beyond a certain point so you, so you don't get that cross type effect. So let me just show you as I put it on my, on my face, look through the, the filter at my face. And as I turn it, you see how much of my face, less, less light is coming in, right? So that's basically what a variable ND is doing is it's diminishing the amount of light based on what the number value is up here. One stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, or five stop. Now you say to me, well, what if I need more than five stops? Let's see, I need six stops, seven stops, eight stops. What do you do? Well, Nisi has also come up with another system. I actually don't have a picture, but maybe Jim can put a link to the system. But they've allowed you to use this variable ND filter with an ND filter on top of this. So a, I think a four or five ND stop on top of this. So five plus one is six. Five plus two is seven. So you, you can put the ND filter on top of this and then turn your variable ND and then add the effects so that you get the desired amount of ND filter. So I think that's a brilliant way of overcoming the limitation of just having one to five stop variable ND and allowing you to go all the way through the spectrum up to eight, nine uh, stops of light. So that's a great way of, uh, of, of controlling of how, how much light gets in your system without necessarily having to go through a quadrilateral system if you don't if you don't want to. So I'm going to share my screen once again.
Okay, hopefully that works. So that's variable ND. So now let's talk briefly about graduated ND filters, okay? Basically, graduated ND filters are at the very basic level, darkest on top, clear on the bottom, and it gradually, gradually goes from dark to clear, depending on whether it's a soft grad ND filter, a medium grad ND filter, or a hard grad ND filter. And as you can imagine, a soft grad ND filter, the transition from the very dark to the clear area is very slow. It's smooth, it's barely perceptible, okay, as, as the transition goes. A medium is a little bit more abrupt, right? It goes from darkest to clear in a more abrupt fashion as opposed to a hard grad ND filter, the change between the darkest to the clearest area is quite abrupt. When do you use this? Well, I typically use a hard grad ND filter when I'm doing seascapes, when the horizon is completely straight and there's, a, uh, there's water below the horizon, sky and light above the horizon. That's where a hard grad ND filter really shines, if you will. That's, that's not a pun, I just, it, it really is great for that. Uh, a soft grad ND filter is really great for when you have, you know, stuff sticking up into the sky, like buildings and trees, you know, and you want that change between the bright sky and the, and the dark foreground or the darker buildings to be more gradual. So the, so yes, it's going to affect the top of the buildings and trees a little bit, but it's not so much that's going to look so weird. That's where the graduated soft ND filters or medium ND filters come into play as opposed to the hard grad ND filters. That's where you use like in a seascape, okay? So let me show you exactly what that looks like. So this is part of Nisi's V5 system. I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna unshare my screen real quick. Uh, here, and you can now see me full screen, hopefully. And so this is a filter <clears throat> and you can see it's clear on the bottom and darkest on the top. And it's darkest up here. And as you go gradually down, it gets clearer and clearer and clearer. So this is a soft grad ND filter because the transition isn't so abrupt, okay? As opposed to something like this. You see this? How the transition now between dark and clear is quite abrupt. So this would be great for seascapes when you have the sky all of a sudden transitioning on to, to the water. So it's great for that. The soft, great for conventional landscapes when you have trees sticking up from the bottom or buildings sticking up from the bottom. So the amount of darkness that it feels or that it sees is not quite as conspicuous as if there was a hard transition. Okay. Let me share my screen once more. So now there's another type. Well, I think this is the type that people who even who know what grad ND filters are, are a little bit apprehensive about, or maybe they just don't know a little bit about. And this is what's called a reverse grad ND filter. Uh, many times, you know, when I do my workshops and I, and I sort of ask the people, you know, what do you, what, what do you, what's your understanding of what a reverse grad ND filter is? Then they go to something like this. They go, oh, that's just a grad ND filter that you turn upside down. No, that is not a reverse grad ND filter. It is its own thing, okay? And this, let me, let me stop, let me stop here uh, and stop sharing the screen. This is a reverse grad ND filter. If you look, the darkest part of this reverse grad ND filter is actually right above the clear space, right over here. And it gets less dark as you go above, it's not clear. It gets less dark as you go up and it gets clear as you go to the bottom. So this is a reverse grad ND filter. So when would you use this? As opposed to a regular grad ND filter, which is darkest at top and just gets less and less dark as you go down. Well, think about a situation, the easiest thing to think is, is where the sun is. So let's say you have the sun at the horizon, right? So the brightest part of the sky is right above the horizon. The sky above is bright, but it's not as bright as it is right above the horizon where the sunlight is. 
and the foreground is dark because you know it's not being lit by the light. So that's when you use a reverse gradient filter because the amount of light you want to diminish is right at the horizon. And you want to diminish light at the top, but not quite as much as in the horizon, as opposed to a regular gradient filter where the sun is a little higher up. Now, the horizon is the part that's not you know, super bright, okay? The super bright part is slightly above it. So you want the darkest part of the filter where the darkest, uh, the brightest part of the sky is. So gradient filter, when the sun is a little higher up or when the light is brighter on top and a reverse gradient filter is great right around sunset time, late afternoon light where the brightest part of the sky is just above the horizon. And hopefully that makes sense. Reverse gradient, so both of them find plenty of use in my camera bag. Let's share my screen again. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you an example of how I use a grad or in this case, a reverse grad and filter. So why did I choose a reverse grad and filter? So this is the resultant image that I got after I post-processed post it. Well, because the sun has just gone down and the brightest part of the sky is still at the horizon, right? Yes, it's bright on top, but it's not quite as bright as it is at the horizon. So this is where I'd use a reverse grad and filter as opposed to, late afternoon when the sun is up here, then I'd use a grad ND filter. So let me just play you this video and look at what happens to the sky here as I sort of slide the grad or reverse grad ND filter down. Okay, so, you know, even though it may seem like Something like this, I'm not going to stop the sharing. Something like this, there should be a very abrupt transition between the sky and the buildings. You notice there isn't. There's just this subtle change in the amount of brightness in the sky relative to the foreground. And that's what you're going for. You're not going for this dramatic changes where all of a sudden the sky is beautifully exposed and the foreground is very, very bright. You want to make subtle changes because then you can make further changes in, 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 in post-processing without making it look obvious that you've used some kind of a graduated filter. I wanna diminish just enough of the light from the sky such that the dynamic range of my sensor catches up, right? Here, the dynamic range between the sky and the, and the, and the foreground may be 18, 19 stops, but let's say my camera is only capable of ca capturing 12, 13, or 14 stops of light. Well, I'm just gonna use the grad anti filter to help that a little bit. I, I don't need a big drastic change because had I used something much stronger, I would have seen the buildings being affected a lot more. The transition between the bright parts of the building that's not affected by the filter versus the dark part of the buildings that's affected by the filter would be too abrupt and too noticeable. If you look at the final image over here, you notice that you really can't tell any kind of a grad ND filter was used. It looks like a single exposure that was quote unquote processed just right. You know, you've got nice uh, light on the foreground. You've got a beautifully tamed sky without any blown highlights. And the buildings, you know, where you expect the transitions to see if you saw a grad ND filter is really not perceptible at all. So that's one of the key points I wanna get across on this, on this seminar is that using a filter it doesn't mean it, it's gonna, it's, it's not a panacea, right? It's not a cure-all. There's still some post-processing involved, but it gets you there much easier, I think, than had you needed to do everything uh, all behind the scenes. If I had to capture this without a filter, I'd have to take multiple exposures, one for the sky, one for the foreground, and try to blend them in. Uh, <clears throat> and that's gonna take more time away from my shooting and more of the, more of the post-processing. Yes, some post-processing was involved here, but much less so uh, than had I not used a filter system. So I hope that makes sense. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat section. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's talk about polarizers. Probably the, the filter that most people put on, except maybe a UV filter. And we can talk about UV filters, whether you believe in those or not. Personally, I don't believe in the UV, UV filters, but that's, that's a discussion for another time. A polarizer basically uh, is one half of that 
a variable ND filter, if you will. It's just a single piece of glass uh, that when you engage it, by engaging meaning that you turn it, it diminishes light from certain angles from hitting uh, the screen, right? So it takes off glare from reflective surfaces such as wet plants, water, wet rocks, uh, skin tones. It has great effect on skin tones. Many people don't think to use polarizers for portraits, but actually it's great. Let me just give you an example. Just, I'm just, I'm just going to stop sharing and tell you, show you what how, how great it really can be on skin tones. Um, so here's a Here's Nisi's version of a polarizer, which is brilliant, by the way. This is their V5 system. They have something for the V7 system. The polarizer actually screws on into their, their filter holder, if you were to use the quadrilateral system, okay? It screws on there. And there's a little lever right here that turns the polarizer. So you don't have to actually sit there and fiddle and try to turn the polarizer on your own because you have all these filters in the way. You've got filters going here. So for example, I'm just showing an example. You'd have filters going in here like this, right? So now if you were to try to use the, pol I mean, it's too hard to use the polarizer except for this lever. This lever lets you use the polarizer very, 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 very easily, this thing right here, okay? So let me tell you, show you what the polarizer actually does. So take a look at my skin tone, for example, as I engage the polarizer. Look like maybe right over here. You see how bright it gets and all of a sudden, it's less bright. You see, you see the glare just goes away right there. For example, this versus this. So this is going to happen in landscape photography to get rid of glare on surfaces of wet rocks. So you can see underneath the water, for example, if you have a, if you have a water surface. And look at this. It really does really work well for skin tones too. Look how much glare there is from the light on, on my cheek without the polarizer engaged. And with the polarizer engaged, look what happens to that. It completely goes away. So I really like that effect. And I think um, more people could actually utilize it. It diminishes the amount of light coming in. I mean, it is. it does have some degree of ND-ness in it because it stops about a stop and a half of light from hitting it. But I think many times it's worth using uh, just, just to get that effect. So let me share my screen again. Okay, the reason I, there's a reason I actually put this image of just the sky. If you use a polarizer on ultra wide angle lenses, you may not like the effect because what it, it's doing is the field of view of the ultra wide angle lens is so big, right? And when you engage a polarizer, uh, you're affecting light from certain angles hitting it. Well, the angle coming from this side of the lens is different than the angle from this side because it's such a wide field of view. So oftentimes in the sky, it'll create this weird gradient where you have a darker shade of blue at one area and the lighter shade of blue somewhere else. This is the exact same reason why if you stack two polarizers on top of each other and you have a system that's not Nisi and it really goes to the extreme, these two effects of this, of this gradient effect cross each other and you get these cross type effects. This is the same reason why two polarizers give you that cross type effect but you can see it in ultra wide angle lenses, even with a single polarizer. So just be very careful if you don't want that effect. Some people actually like that effect. They like that sort of gradient effect, but if you want a more natural looking sky where you know it's not dark here, bright here, bright here, then I suggest taking two images. One image with the polarizer engaged. So you get the effect of getting rid of the glare from the foreground and another image um, with the polarizer not engaged. So the foreground is left alone, it still looks yucky, but at least the sky is fixed. And then just simply paint in the sky from one image to the image, uh, to the foreground of the other image. So you get the effect of the polarizer in the foreground and no effect of the polarizer in the sky. That's a, that's a neat little trick that you can use to, 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 to benefit yourself. One other thing before I get off the topic of polarizer, many people who first go to a workshop will buy a polarizer and they'll put it on. And they think, oh, I've got a polarizer, it's great. But remember to engage the polarizer, right? Unless you actually turn the polarizer uh, to a certain amount, you've done nothing. All you've done is put a piece of dark glass in front of your lens. And also remember, if you're shooting from landscape to portrait, all of a sudden you've changed the orientation of your polarizer. So you're gonna have a different effect. So 
you have to look at what the polarizer is doing with each shot, whether it's landscape or portrait. Even if you change the angle and you look from left to right, look behind you, because it all, it's all dependent on what the, what the angle of light is coming in from all directions. So even if you do just something like that, you still have to check how your polarizer is being affected. So you constantly have to check going back and forth to see how much engagement you have of it and what kind of effect you're having on your scene. Mahesh. Yes. Jim, I just wanted to mention one thing. Yes. Nifty little trick that uh, you can also try if you do have a situation where you're using an ultra wide and you're getting the uh, darkening on one corner is that if you're using the M75 kit like you you have or the V7, yeah. you can drop a medium uh, graduated in on the other side uh, or drop medium graduated into your holder and yep. angle it so that it balances to the other side. Right. And that's a that's a little trick that's used uh, to sometimes uh, create more uh, more of an even tone across the whole sky. That's a good point. And, yeah, it's it's just a, a neat little trick that uh, I see a lot of photographers use, and um, it's something you can't do with a circular polarizer, but you can do it with a round threaded polarizer, but right, with the V7 right. or the M75 system. So just That's wanted great. to throw that in there. That's perfect. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to I'll try to have to use that use that next time. Yeah. Okay. Let me. I think I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay, so another filter that finds itself in my sort of repertoire or my camera bag is the neutral night filter. And this is what, well, this is the effect of the neutral night filter. So this is a picture I took recently of Mount Rainier National Park, and this is great for astrophotography. And I'm looking south here, and there's a lot of light pollution coming from smaller towns south of here, even Portland. It gets There's enough light from Portland that it reaches all the way all, to, all the way to this area. And it gives this ugly, oranges, greenish type of effect, which I don't think is super easy to get rid of in Photoshop. You have to sit there a while because as you change the white balance on the yellow, then the green looks funny. And if you change the white balance on the green, the yellow looks funny. Uh, but uh, Nisi makes this filter. It's called the neutral or natural night. Sorry, this should say natural, not neutral. A natural night filter. Uh, and let me stop sharing my screen. And this is basically what it is. It's this sort of weird purple blue tone that I don't know has some magic fairy dust or something because every time I use this, I get the perfectly white balanced, <laughs> white balanced uh, astro, astro shots. So, you know, when there's not a lot of light pollution, I don't necessarily need that because putting it on actually gives a little bit of a uh, of a cool tone that I may not necessarily like, but it's easy to get rid of in um, uh, in Photoshop because it's a single tone. Uh, but when there's a, a quite a bit of artificial light, like like when I shoot Mount Rainier, basically there's nowhere in Mount Rainier you can shoot that there's no light pollution because it's so close to all the big cities. Then I constantly resort to this natural light light filter that I really love. So in some sense. Uh, it's not really a neutral density filter. Uh, it's more of a colored filter, but it but because I use it so often for my landscape photography, particularly astro, I just thought I'd mention it. Okay, let me share my screen again. Perfect. Now, so here's a filter I'm just going to briefly mention because you may or may not have heard of. Chances are you actually probably haven't heard of it. Uh, and this used to be in the old film days. So when you had these very, very super bright lenses, like a, like a Noctilux lens from Leica, like the F.95 uh, or the Canon F1.2, uh, or even modern lenses that are like F1.4, uh, you notice that shot wide open, it, it causes a little vignetting at the periphery. That's just the optics of the lens because it's so wide. Uh, in the digital age, it's it's trivial to correct that in Lightroom or Photoshop. But if you didn't want to go through that added step, you could get what's called this center graduated neutral density filter such that, I don't know if you can tell on the slide, but slightly darker in the center and slightly clearer. So basically you're creating this graduate neutral density filter, except it's going from the peripheral uh, inwards. So that's sort of a neat trick if you didn't want to deal with that vignetting all the time. 
rare to find these filters, but if you ever see it or you hear of it, this is what they're talking about, a central graduated neutral density filter. So I wanna end the talk a little bit and I wanna leave room for questions is, or some of the other things I have with me when I go out, particularly for landscape type of photography. Uh, and some of these are obvious and some of these you may not think of. So for example, a remote release, right? So here's an example, this is the remote release I use. It's a cheap remote release. It's made for, uh, it's made for Sony, it's a third party. What I love about this is it's completely weatherproof. You know, I've, I've dropped this in flowing water and it actually floats, it doesn't sink. <laughs> So it's great. For, so it's 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 I've, I've I, I keep like three of these, one in each each bag and one in another compartment. Uh, in fact, one of them I even have a little air tag attached to it, so I don't so I don't lose it or know where it is. So that's great because the name of the game for landscape photography mm -hmm. is to keep your system as still as possible, right? You could use a remote timer on your on your on your camera, but it's so great to just being able to use these these remotes and just pressing the button. Uh, and having the shutter go up exactly when you want it, not two seconds later or five seconds later, because sometimes timing uh, does matter a lot. And I like the wireless over the wired remote, because oftentimes if it's wired, you're going to have to uh, pull that little gasket off from the side of your camera. And if it's a weather sealed camera, it's no longer weather sealed anymore because you've taken that little piece out to attach something in. So I've gotten away from using wired type of remote, remote shutters to a wireless remote center. And some, some of the cheap ones are actually even waterproof and weatherproof and they float. Sturdy tripod. Now I cannot emphasize this enough. You know, I tell people if it's too heavy, leave a lens home, leave two lenses home, but don't leave your tripod at home because the best shots are when the, when the light is very low. You know, when you're shooting at one second, two seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, and there's no way in God's green earth you're going to be able to handhold uh, things like that uh, for the most part. Now, there are systems out there that, that are remarkable uh, that, that can do some hand, handheld uh, long exposure shots. But still, to guarantee yourself the best optical quality, not having to resort to high ISOs, not having to resort to wide open apertures where nothing is in focus except a little razor thin amount where you can have everything optimally, you're going to use a tripod because your aperture is going to be like f8 f11 right and my favorite tripod currently is actually one uh it's called the explorer i think and i think jim mentioned that there's actually a uh, discount going on for this webinar and this is why i like this it's robust not that heavy it's carbon fiber the ball head is i think separate but it's a beautiful ball head and even in the heaviest lenses right even in my 7200 f2.8, 100 to 500, even when there's windy conditions. I've actually put this in flowing water when I'm trying to capture pictures of waterfall, but I have to go into the stream. I put this into the stream and some water is hitting the bottom of this tripod as, as it's sort of flowing across. Still, there's no vibration. So I get tack sharp images, uh, which means that, you know, yes, you're going to have to carry a little bit of heft with you, but it's so worth it to, to get these these amazing images. And remember, the higher the megapixel that you're using on your camera, the more important it becomes to really have your system very, very steady. And the foundation of that, if you will, is, is a rock steady tripod. And I like carbon fiber because sort of the weight to sturdiness ratio is so much better than with aluminum. Okay, uh, filter wrench. This is something you probably don't even think about or you, or you may not be aware of. But it's this guy right here. Let me let me see. Let me stop this uh, share. Uh, it's this thing right here. It's a little wrench for your filters. So basically, it grows around your filter like this when when it's on your camera system. So you know how sometimes when you go out and you've got a filter screwed onto your lens, and the weather changes, or the temperature changes, and man, you can't get that filter off. Or, God forbid, you put two filters on top of each other and one filter is stuck on the other. I know people's, you know, whole photography trips ruined because they can't get that filter off. It's They're so tight. Not because they screwed it on so tight initially, but because of changes in temperature and weather conditions, that's happened. Well, this will save your life in those situations. I mean, it's a great way. It really grips it. It's, it has like a rubber coating and it becomes really easy. So I always carry one of these uh, in my bag to get rid of those... Uh, uh, those pesky ring filters that have attached or, or stuck to the front of your element or to each other even. 
Okay. So next, oh, absorbable hand towels, all right? So these, like these, and there's no reason for you to buy these tiny micro cloths, right? They serve basically no purpose. They get saturated with water with like one use. Uh, and, uh, and some of them that are bigger, they're more expensive and they live, leave a, a film behind. Go to Costco. They, they sell these little yellow towels. In fact, I have an orange one, but it's basically, it's like this, okay? and has little absorbable material. It doesn't leave a lint behind. I use this to wipe off my camera, wipe off the front elements of my lint, particularly if you're going to shoot waterfalls or you're shooting in inclement weather. You know, that tiny little lens cloth that you have is gonna have one wipe and it's gonna be completely wet. And these things are super cheap. You can get like 30 of them for like 15 bucks at Costco. It's at the automotive section. So get those and keep keep several in your bags. It'll you'll thank me because it has multiple uses. Ah, at night, make sure you're always carrying a headlamp. I always have this in a bag. I just leave it in whether it's night or day because sometimes I go for a day trip and it gets dark and I'm walking down or hiking down a trail and it's really nice to have a, a light. Particularly, try to get one with red or some of them actually even have green. Some people say green light is better for night vision. Red light is definitely better than night vision for than white light, but some people say green light is even better than red light. So I have a red light one. I haven't tried a green light one. Uh, so so think about that because particularly at night, even even if it's not night, you know, and and you know my eyes aren't so great anymore as the older I get, I need a little bit of light to see what my uh, tiny controls uh, are labeled. So that really helps for that. Uh, and finally, you know, there are a bunch of apps out there get one cheap, you know, or, or free that calculates exposure times. You know, oftentimes I'm putting 10, 16 stop ND filters in front of me and I, I know what the exposure is without a filter and I don't want to go through these mental calculations and, uh, <laughs> and bring out a calculator. But if you just have a little cheat sheet or a little app that tells you what the exposure time should be, depending on what type of ND filter you put on your, on your lens, that it's a little thing, but it, it, it saves you time and frustration uh, over and over again particularly if you really get into any kind of a long exposure type of photography. Um, okay. And I do want to leave a little bit of uh, room for questions, but before I end, this is sort of my recommendation as a starter kit for people, depending on what you want to shoot. Uh, as a landscape photographer, I mean, I'll tell you exactly what's in my bag. Okay. I always have a polarizer. I always have a six stop ND filter. I always have a three stop soft grad ND filter. Okay. In addition to that, now that's for the budding landscape photographer. If you were just starting out, I also carry a 10 stop ND filter, uh, a three stop reverse grad ND filter. And when I'm doing Astro, my trusty natural light filter. So I'm not bogged down by a bunch of filters. I mean, they, Nisi makes these great, this is the V7 system. This is great for, uh, if I have a full frame sensor with 82 millimeter lenses, you know, that I'm not hiking a lot with. But if I have to go for backpacking trips or hiking trips, I love the Nisi's B5 system. Look how, look how tiny it is. All the filters I need to fit right in here. It takes a very, very little space uh, in my bag. Uh, and more importantly, it doesn't weigh very much. So it's all about weight uh, as far as I'm concerned. So that's a great. And you don't have to sacrifice quality. Uh, uh, by, by some, some lesser systems. This is a great system in a compact package. But if you're just starting out and you want three things, just three things to carry, a polarizer, six stop ND, and a three stop soft grad ND, I think is, is the way to go. Uh, and depending whether you have a large system or a small system, go with the V5 uh, or the V7 uh, kit. So if you're a budding portrait photographer, although I, I do do some portraits, I think from talking to my friends, the most important thing that they carry in their equipment uh, bag is an ND filter, uh, a, a variable ND filter. So this variable ND filter, which goes from one to five stop, that's I think a must for your, for your system because you can easily control the amount of light getting into your system, maintain that one over twice the shutter speed uh, that you need for that aperture uh, and just not get those cross hatch type of artifacts. So that's a great way. Uh, for, for the videographer. And if you're a portrait, again, you could use the ND or just get a variable ND filter. Okay, that's it for me, guys. I know I gave you guys a lot of information. Uh, I want to leave some time uh, for questions uh, if you have any. 
at this time, if you want to turn on your camera and turn on your microphone and directly ask a question of Mahesh or of us, uh, now is the time. Or you can continue to um, ask questions via chat. Now, yeah, one of the wait. things that I wanted to mention was there are a few things that sometimes get overlooked by us because Nisi has, oh my gosh, over 700 items. That's just Nisi, not even Explorer or uh, any of our other brand uh, or ob objects that we sell. But one thing that we have that's really fantastic, and Mahesh, I have to make sure that uh, I let you try one out. Yeah. Is, uh, we have a wireless remote ah. that actually mates with our free app, which is an exposure calculator. And what it is, guys, it is a small device that you attach via a wire to your camera. And when you put your camera on B for bulb for long exposure, the, the this little attachment will Bluetooth connect to your phone and via the Nisi app will actually allow you to calculate your long exposure and, and actuate the shutter via the app of the phone. So if you have, say, a 30-minute exposure because you're using a 15-stop neutral density filter, you literally push start on the app and it'll count down and uh, and end the exposure right on time. And it even has exposure compensation in there in case you want to, um, uh, you know, do some bracketing. And Roseanne just asked um, about the link. I did put the link a little further up in the chat, so it is there. Um, I'll also, um, maybe I can get... Uh, my uh, my my man in in Sydney to place it again or re, or redo it, um, and yes, those the the foam gaskets that are on our neutral density filters are there so that there's a light tight seal uh, between the uh, the filters and the lens. We're very very careful about making sure that there's no internal reflections. So the foam is one of the things we use. And the foam, if you handle your, your filters well, you, you could probably, you know, use the foam on the get, on the filters for years. But a lot of times people, you know, sliding them in and out or sliding them in and out of their case, you know, a little corner catches and they start to come, you know, get caught or they start to deteriorate depending on the where you live and what the weather conditions are. So... That foam is very easily replaceable by you, and you can get a pack of three replacement gaskets. So you can probably use never even get down to using the last one, and they're they're like eight ninety nine. You do have to get them directly from us, but they're there for the asking. Yeah, that's a great point, Jim. Because uh, I have had that exact same problem. Uh, I think somebody mentioned in the chat is that. I mean, I'm very careful, but sometimes they do get jammed when you're in a hurry and you have to, you know, oh, my light's changing. Uh, and it's it's so nice to know that uh, they are user replaceable and it's uh, so inexpensive. You know, you don't have to throw away your expensive ND filter just because the, oh. the backing backing got loose or got torn. That's a great point. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay, we have a Nisi V7 right now, which means that there was a V6, there was a V5, there was a V whatever, whatever. Uh, everything, everything is uh, replaceable. If if um, whatever happens to these, we have all the parts for them, so they're not meant to just be used for you know a year or two and then time to buy another one. Um. It, I'm just reading Roseanne's uh, uh, note here, Ro and, uh, and I'll answer you, Roseanne. So the, the the foam is necessary. However, I yeah 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 I can't really show you, but if you're using a Nisi holder, there should really be no um, no issue with sliding the uh, filters in and out. If 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 there is 
then you just need to be shown that and a support call to us will help that because we can we can do like a, a Teams or a, a Zoom meeting with you. But usually the best thing to do is to lay the filter flat over the uh, slots. So you're like laying it down flat over the slots and then slide it right in. And the one thing about the V7 holders or the, the V holders in general and the M75 holder in general is, is that we use a scalloped um, retention uh, mechanism. So the filters move very, very, um, very smoothly through the, through the holder. And if it's not, then you are doing something wrong. Now, I can tell you something that literally just popped in my head as I was saying it. And that is, you do want to use Nisi filters with the, with the little lettering that's on there. You either want that pointing up or down. Because if you have it sideways, the foam, the foam is goes to the edges a little more. You you want to make sure that that the lettering on your filter is either up or down, and you should never have a problem with the foam again. Uh, Danny, to everyone, do you recommend circular or square filters? Mahesh, you want to take that one on? Yes, yes. So that's a that's a great question. That's the question I get asked all the time. It depends on how lazy you are. No, <laughs> seriously. Uh, you know. I think circular filters are great, but you're basically relegated to uniform filters. You, you basically polarizers, ND filters, and natural light filters. Now, believe it or not, there's some companies out there that actually even make quote unquote graduated ND filters circular, but they 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 violate the most secret rule of landscape photography. They put that horizon directly at the center where it's dark and light. So nobody ever shoots that way. So if you want to go beyond some basic photography of just using ND filters, then I highly recommend uh, a quadrilangular square type filters. Now, if you're a whiz with Photoshop, yes, you can take multiple exposures, blend them and get the graduate ND effect. But if you want to capture most of your uh, creativity in front of your camera versus uh, you know, versus behind the computer. And there's no right answer. Some people actually appreciate that that exercise, then you could get away with circular filters. But for what I like to do, uh, I have circular filters for certain situations and I have square filters for other situations. But if there's one system, if I could only have one system, it would be the, uh, with the, we'd be the quadrilateral square filter system. What do you think, Jim? Well, first of all, I think that uh, quadrilateral should be, uh, Replace should replace everything such as drop in, <laughs> rectangular. I like yep. quadrilateral. I think we need to start a movement. I like that. <laughs> you, I, you heard it here first, folks. Is the way to go. It's absolutely the way to go. I um, you know, it's very funny that the that the um quadrilaterals quadrilateral lateral system i guess maybe i shouldn't use that quadrilateral uh, <laughs> is absolutely a better approach to adding filters to cameras and they're actually even easier to switch out it's faster to change out a nd3 to an nd9 uh by by pulling one out and pushing one in rather than unscrewing and screwing back in but the one thing that's absolutely undeniable about circular filters is, is that they're very small and compact and they're no bigger than the front diameter of your lens. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's a, it's never ending argument. It's the same argument as, you know, fix it in Photoshop or, or do it or, or use the filters in the field. Uh, you know, should should you use a, an APS-C camera or a full frame camera? All right. of these things are um, are are really just personal choice. Now, as far as magnetic circular filters, because Ruben just asked that, the reason why I I always say this, I always say the reason why we don't make magnetic filters, and then I imagine right after I say that, there's going to be an announcement from Nisi. We now make magnetic <laughs> filters. But the reason we don't make magnetic filters is because there's two things. First of all, they have to weigh more. That's number one. And number two, 
even though they can make a very, very, very secure uh, bond to th the lens or the adapter that you use to, that they give you that it adheres to, if there is a lateral type of motion on them where they're allowed to slide off, they slide off just as easily as can be. And if you're walking through the woods and you're you're going through brushes and you know through bushes and you're going against trees and stuff, and your lens happens to hit from the side, that filters off, that filter's gone. If it's screwed in, it's screwed in. Uh, the new filters that we're using, which is the new push-on system, it just came out. Uh, and what that is, is that's how we add a um, four-stop filter to our variable filter. All we've been doing since these things have come out is we've been pushing them on and pulling them off the cameras and like shaking the cameras and everything. We, it's, it appears that the factory did a remarkable job of making the friction filters stay put. And in that case, the only way they can be really pop off is if something grabs it from underneath the rim and pulls it away from the uh, from the ring. So, you yeah, know. Jim, I can I can I can say from personal experience that magnetic filters, no matter how strong they are, they will come off because that's exactly the situation that that happened to, to me once. Is that I was carrying my tripod on the camera over my shoulder, walking somewhere, and if somebody called my name, I happened to turn around. And then the front element hit against something light, even it wasn't even like a rock or a tree and that it didn't break, but it definitely fell off. So it's kind of like, you know, your Apple pencil that you put on your iPad, no matter how strong that bond is, like when I put in my backpack, it seems to come off, right? Because it, yes, you know, it, it, it resists the pull, pull pressure, but any kind of a, uh, a sheer force on it where it's being sort of, uh, you know, uh, the force is applied longitudinally then it's not going to it's not going to hold up that's just the nature of magnets yeah it's there it's a great idea it's a great yeah. idea but you know we we just don't have that gloria you said could we have a link to those please i don't know what link to what those are i think this is it i'm going to try to put this i think i found it jim let me see if I, this, this helps if this is what they're talking about Is that the one? I'm not sure. Yeah, the new Swift system. I actually put it up earlier. That's great. Thank you. And it's, they're really, it, 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 it's a really, it's a really remarkable step up and thinking in a, in a, and thinking out of the box type of solution. Because one of the, the biggest drags is, is having a filter and it just, doesn't quite do enough for you. And then you're like looking for the other filter and unscrewing the filter and screwing the filter in and maybe it cross threads, all that. Here you just push it on. You push it on and there it is. You've got another four stops of, uh, of um, light reduction. And yeah. what's really important, you know, it, a little more technical, but what's really, really important, especially to um, people who like to shoot video is you you can't in 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 photography you can use the exposure triangle you can use the iso the f stop and the shutter speed but in video you really can't change any of those because if you're looking for a consistent look in your video if you change the frame rate speed it's going to have a different look if you change the iso it's going to change the, it's going to have a different look if you change the aperture it's going to have a different right. look so a variable ND is the absolute best control over that, that one aspect that uh, doesn't require any of those other uh, settings to be changed. And right. that's applicable in still photography as well. Um, but especially, especially in video, it, it, a, a variable ND is absolutely the way to go. And they're finally good. They're fine with the Nisi variable. They're finally good. And do we miss any questions along here? I don't know. I'm trying to look through them. 
All right. Well, if not, then I think we've had a good hour and five minutes. Oh, hold on one more. Should the UV filter be taken off when using filters? Yes. Even I have to answer <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But, but since we're a comp here's this was a really good question that I got asked when I first started working for Nisi, and I had to kind of go back and say, what's the right answer to this? Is we're we're advocating stacking as many as four filters in front of your lens. And I've always been from the school of, you know, keep it down to the minimum. Well, it turns out that since our filters are made from lens grade optical glass, our filters will diminish the uh, image quality and the resolution to an um, to an imperceptible uh, level. Uh, you know, when you have lens grade optical glass in front of your lenses, it's like having the several elements in your lens. You know, there, it's all it's all just part of the light path, and the and the filters are so good. That's what's ruined the reputation of filters as being. Um, uh, uh, you know, decreasing the quality of the image is because so many companies made cheap filters. So many companies made a filter. We we have a polarizing filter we sell for $180 and there's a competitor out there that sells it for, I don't know, $20, $25. There's a difference. There's a difference. And, you know, I think Rosie asked a question. I was expecting to see a noticeable difference when rotating the true color uh, as in the regular circuitizer, and did not see it. So, so I think I think optic well, needs to give I a good to... answer. But another 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 answer is that depending on what direction you're looking at with the <laughs> with the uh, with the polarizer, it actually may not have any effect. Uh, you know, for example, if there's no light, if the sun has gone down, and there's you know, sometimes you have no effect. You have to have light coming down. You have to be looking a certain distance, this uh, direction, to sort of see maxima or even minimum effects of the polarizer. So it may not have a perceptible difference. And if you don't see a perceptible difference, there's no reason to put on the polarizer. But what's actually interesting, and, and Rosie, your question could be asked and answered in two ways. Are you saying that you don't see a color difference between the two filters? Because there should be. But if you're saying that you're rotating the true color filter and it's not having an effect, you're looking through it the wrong way turn it so that the threads are, are facing you as though they were on the camera. And don't feel bad about it. I completely, I've been in this business for a many, many years. And because I never looked through a polarizing, a circular polarizing filter without thinking about the threads being back towards me. One time I did it with a cinema filter and I noticed that on the cinema filter, it said front on the cinema filter. And I was like, why does it say front? It's because you have to be looking through it the right way. And if you don't, you're going to, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, but if you very do, true. Or it's just like, you know, when people put a polarizer on, sometimes when I, when I start starting photography, they go, I've got the polarizer on. It's just, it's just darkening my image. It's not having any effect. Well, you have to turn it to engage it. So I've, I've heard, I've seen that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. And again, if you have any issues with it and want to talk about it more directly, please feel free to reach out to us directly at the office. Uh, this was great, Jim. Thank you for letting me uh, present. And I, I hope uh, I've been helpful for, uh, for for some of you guys. And if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to I'm going to put my email address here. And that's my direct email address. If you need to get a hold of me, if you have any questions. Uh, I want to also to make sure, I'm so sorry, but I've been keeping kind of an extra eye on the um, on the YouTube feed, and uh, a gentleman named uh, Peter asked, "Are there round graduated filters?" Yes, we have them. Uh, go for the square ones. Go for the quadrilateral yeah. ones. Uh, how long is discount good? Discount code good for? Can we please look at that slide again, uh, people in Sydney? 
Possibly. I, I seem to think October 23rd, but don't quote me on that. Well, we should see it. There we yeah. are. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. October 23rd, and it's 15 live. Like a steel trap up here. <laughs> live. live <laughs> yes. All right, guys. I guess we will uh, call it a night, and thank you all very much. Uh, this is being recorded, so it'll be on our YouTube channel, Nisi Optics USA. Mahesh, thank you so very, very much. Oh, my You're pleasure. Thank you. Fantastic. I really, uh, I really love when you do these for us. And I'll be in touch soon, sir. I'll, be, I'll probably reach out to you tomorrow. Oh, no worries. No worries. Great to hear Everyone. from you. And uh, have a great day, guys. Great. Bye. Bye, guys.